Good morning, everyone. It's Carol Laurie, and I'm here with my dear friend and colleague, Dr. Kiara Barr, who is a mind body specialist focusing on skin health, which is an interesting, you never think of skin being connected to your mind and your body, but guess what? It is. So thank you so much for being here. And you just mentioned to me that you're speaking where? Tell everyone what yeah. you're going to do. I'll be speaking at the American Academy of Dermatology all about mind-body therapies in dermatology, really showing my colleagues what the evidence is, because as you said, um, most people don't put two and two together. That right. Really? Yeah. Yeah. And it's so fascinating. How do they go together? Because this is a new concept for me. I actually never really thought about the skin and well, everything's connected, but share with us. Yeah. I mean, if you think about it, we always use metaphors like they're getting under my skin, my skin is crawling off, and it makes sense, right? So our brain and our skin are actually derived from the same embryologic tissue, the ectoderm. So there is a very intimate connection between our brains and our skin. And there's this bi-directional communication. So when we think about stress, especially, we always think of this top-down um, process with activation of our hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, sending mm -hmm. off signals and hormones and uh, surging throughout our body. And our skin is actually a target of that, but it's also a source. Our skin actually has its very own HPA axis. Really? Huh. Yep. Mm -hmm. So it can make the very same hormones that are created in our brain. So that's why when um, we are under stress of various sorts, people may notice that their skin is flaring. That their is breaking out, out, right. Yeah, they're breaking out, their eczema is getting worse, they're itchy, they're dry, they're inflamed. Those are the reasons. So how does it, what is, tell us more about the skin hypothalamic environment. Yeah, so in our brain, so just to back it up a little bit, so stress, I just want to name that it's not all bad, right? There's what we call eustress and, and then there's distress, the things that cause us to feel uncomfortable. Um, but we need stress. It's, a, it's part of our adaptation. And so when there's a stressor, let's say, huh, the pandemic or the news, you know, things that kind of yeah, no act joke. watching the news is a stressful, horribly oh, stressful. Right. Or just emails in your inbox. So <laughs> your to-do list. I mean, I could go on. I'm feeling stressed yeah. just about it. Um, and so those stressors activate our stress response system, which activates a part of the brain, the hypothal hypothalamus, which send signals to another part of your brain, um, the pituitary, and then your adrenals. And it just triggers a whole cascade of hormones, inflammatory signals, and messengers that flow throughout your system. And your skin has receptors to receive those signals. And then your skin itself has the same capacity to send all those messenger signals and hormones throughout your body. So that's kind of um, just a encapsulated short, short version of that. But what really happens when some of these hormones um, are flowing throughout your body, what happens is the cortisol, which is your primary stress hormone, directly triggers your oil glands. That's one oh, of the reasons. Nobody ever talks about this. That's why you break out. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, and stress is hard to, it's it's part of our everyday, right? Like the new current, <laughs> of, bless you, current yeah. events are happening. Life is happening. So there's no way to get rid of stress, nor do we want to. But the key is how do we regulate our own innate adaptive system to work in our favor, right? To work with our biology versus working against our biology. And so that's what I work with women, especially is to teach them those skills. Great, so that's so important. So where do you start? I mean, I think everybody needs this information because my community, most of them are older women. It's not mm -hmm. like, we have teenage or 20 year, 30 year, we have some 30 year olds, but most are 40 and up. 
but going through chemotherapy, getting diagnosed with breast cancer, you know, it's a hormonal imbalance already. And then they go through treatment. It's extremely stressful. Where do you start? Yeah, I think that is such a good point. And actually, even though it's not directly related to breast cancer, one of the talks that I, I will be giving at the um, academy is how stress affects the tumor microenvironment. And we know oh, the literature is there. That's my topic. The literature is there to show that stress plays a role in tumor formation, progression, and survive survivorship. Oh yeah, so, absolutely. So learning how to manage your stress is really important. And the key thing of where to start is understanding what each individual finds stressful. Because what I find stressful, what my stresses are, are going to yeah. be very different. Like, are, what is your personal definition of stress? We start there right? We start there so that we can meet ourselves where we're at. And then from there, learn um, some mindfulness. There, there's a lot of embodiment and, and somatic practices where it's not just in our heads, but really reconnecting to our bodies. Okay. Because a lot of times when we are feeling stress, we can't, we can't articulate it, right? Our brain just shuts down. That literally is an, an adaptive response. Nothing yeah, has gone. Say that. You take a breath in and you go, <gasps> and then, you know, eventually you exhale, but all that uh, is still in your body. And, you know, then you just put all those emotions and feelings on the back burner and you just get through treatment. And then at the end of treatment, <clears throat> I often say this women, all of a sudden, all that stuff that you put on the back burner, it just comes flooding up forward. Yeah. And it's like an existential, emotional, psychic crisis. Women, you know, get on the verge of almost having a nervous breakdown. They're, it's so intense. And that's real, right? It is absolutely real. And I, I just want to name that, you know, and acknowledge that, that nothing has gone wrong. Our, we are wired, our brain, three things that it, that it prioritizes. Keeping us safe, right, is number one. So we avoid pleasure. I mean, sorry, we we avoid pleasure <laughs> by default because our brain is trying to seek, essentially seek pleasure, avoid pain, um, and do things as efficiently as possible, right? Which means that we are on autopilot. We push through, we put things on the back burner. And even though we're trying to seek pleasure, a lot of times it's these immediate false pleasures, over drinking, social media, things that feel good maybe in the moment, but still leaves us feeling trapped and stuck and not really processing through the deeper trauma. I mean, it is traumatic to be diagnosed with cancer. Yeah. To be diagnosed with cancer, then the treatment. And then what happens after that? It's a lot. It, it is, is a lot. Um. You know, as a homeopath, so much of what you're saying is how I take a case and look at a person. Because in our society, there is this concept of stress mm -hmm. or depression or anxiety. But one of, one of the things I, I go, okay, that's a chapter heading. Let's go underneath. And what is the sensation for you? And women look at me and they go, what does that mean? What's the sensation? Well, I don't understand. You know, I'm stressed or I'm anxious. So, you know, we have to go deeper. It's like, what are the thoughts that happen in your mind? How does it feel in your body? What do you then do? How do you comfort yourself? I mean, so much of this, women get into what is an, they think is an adaptive, but it's an unconscious adaptive response to a situation. And that leads to unhealthy choices. And I think one of the beauties of what you're talking about is to really help somebody get in touch with all of that and then be able to make more positive choices to get out of that unhealthy rut, right? Absolutely. And I'll name it's not everyone is ready to go there, right? There are times when if you're feeling really stressed and someone just says, just take a deep breath, go. Sometimes I'm punch that person in the face. Like, I can't breathe right now. What are you talking about? Right? So, like, I think. <laughs> And meditation and all that, you know, if you, I get it because seven, 10 years ago when my own health fell apart, if someone just said meditate, I would have been like, you know, as the New York, I would have been like, 
back off. Um, well, that's a nice way of saying it. I mean, you have to be in a certain relaxed state to be able to meditate. If you're too agitated and utz, you can, you know, somebody tells you to meditate, as you said, it's like, I don't think so. I mean, you got to get into a calm enough place to be able to calm and meditate. Before. Otherwise, you just want to tell the person to, you know, not crack off against, yeah, go away. That's, it's like when somebody, women say to me, you know, I've, I'm like really anxious about my cancer coming back. And I talk to my friends and colleagues about it and they go, oh, don't worry, you'll be fine. It's like, I don't, that's not going to cut it. It's not a don't worry, you're going to be fine moment. You need to understand that you're doing everything possible to reduce your risk. That's part of what we're talking about. So here is a woman who's been traumatized and she's a little, you know, appropriately agitated. And I want to make sure to really, that women do not feel like you are doing something wrong if you can't meditate. 100%. And that's, that was my point. Meditation can be, can come in many different forms. It can be like the sitting that stereotypical, like, oh, or it could be moving meditation. It could walking in nature. Like for me, right. I struggle. I struggle to just sit and quiet my mind. I always have to listen to a guided meditation. But part of the work that I do is, right, we, movement is part of this. Because sometimes you can't sit down. Sometimes you feel rage, you feel anger. And creating a safe space to mobilize and actualize those emotions is really important. So there are many different ways to manage the emotion that aren't just sitting down, breathing, because so sometimes that just isn't the right fit, right? So we have to just meet people where they're at. So if you are struggling with feeling, you know, you're agitated, that's okay. There are ways to manage that so that you can then feel a sense of ease and sense of calm, right? We need, those emotions are healthy and normal and part of the human experience. Uh, that's really important to acknowledge because our society, the messaging, and there's a couple commercials for women, It's it drives me crazy. Oh, of course, it's about an antidepressant. Mm. And the woman is depressed. The, there's a a view of the house and it's a quote unquote, a mess, the dishes in the sink, the beds aren't made. And I'm, and a woman is sitting there and she's obviously depressed. And I, the first time I saw that commercial, I started yelling at the TV. It's like, why is this a woman's responsibility to keep the house clean? Where is her partner? Whether it's a man or a woman, where are the kids? Whatever, why are you putting this on the woman? And then, and what happened that she's feeling that way? Obviously it doesn't uh, happen overnight. That's another key ladies. Depression, anxiety, falling apart doesn't happen overnight, right? It takes a long time to get there, just like it takes a while for breast cancer to develop. It's not your responsibility to keep the stupid house clean. I love it. Yeah, the invisible workload of women, it is. Invisible it is workload, invisible. yeah. So they're actually, um, yeah, it's like death by a, a million paper cuts, right? Like it just stacks up the dishes, the, the laundry, the this, the that, and everyone looking, looking at you like it's your responsibility. It's about setting boundaries, communication. You're in a partnership. And so it, it, it takes time, but really voicing what you need. But the whole point of this invisible workload, there was actually a study. And I think it was either Iceland or some country like that, where they actually look Iceland. Iceland. Yeah, Right where where they looked at how much money would actually if if women got paid, they oh, went on yeah. strike, and it was like an obscene amount of money that it would take fifty years for the biggest corporations to generate that revenue, and so that country yeah. those women actually helped close the wage gap because they were able to prove like we do a shit ton of stuff here you don't even know, yeah. like if we all went on strike they'd be screwed, right. In our morning, we do more than most people do all day. So um, so anyway, in this commercial, she takes a pill and then there's another photo of her. And now her husband has come into the picture and the house is clean and everybody, the dishes are gone, the beds are made and everybody's celebrating. And she is serving the family dinner. So the message for me here is, first of all, I think it's very important that women do not silently take this on ourselves. If mm -hmm. you have, even if you have a five-year-old 
they can be taught to take the dishes off the table and put them by the sink. Everybody in the house works together and the family works together to the best of their age ability to keep the house functioning smoothly. It's a sign of low self-esteem that we as women take this all on. And I think when you get diagnosed with a serious illness or disease such as breast cancer, or you have inflamed skin, we can talk about the messaging of that in a minute, uh, we need to pay attention to the clues that your body is giving you that the system that you've set up many for a while is no longer really in all truthfulness working for you, right? Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. And to be honest, that's how I wound up in this situation myself doing the work that I do. So about a decade ago, I was completely deaf to the signs and, and messages that my body was sending me. I was running ultra marathons. I was in pain all the time. My skin was changing. Yeah, I mean, my skin was changing, growing and changing moles. And the focus of my practice at that time was skin cancer and melanoma. Oh. I, I had to diagnose myself with early melanoma. Well, that's a wake up call. It was a wake up call. And from there, then tore my labrum, had to have reconstructive surgery. From there, all the hormonal issues wound up having a hysterectomy. Like, I mean, it just... You were in your 40s when this happened or something? Early, yeah. my early 40s. Mm -hmm. Early 40s. And my colleague, like we weren't taught in Western medicine to really pay attention to these signs. And I was like, what is happening? And my body had been shouting at me. And I was just like, no, 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 no. Like, don't have time for la, 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 la. Like, I'm not listening. I just have to like achieve. Yeah, that's what anxiety is, ladies. That's, that's what anxiety is. I just had an appointment with a woman who was trying to fit herself into a square when she was round and she was in therapy and she was dealing with her anxiety. I said to her, you don't have an anxiety disorder. You have a not paying attention to the clues problem. It's and that was a transformative moment for her. It was like, oh yeah, I'm not messed up. It's like, I'm not listening. Totally, totally. It's a, I would say it's a communication problem. So skincare, from my perspective, is about connection and relationship. It's our Beautiful. connection to ourselves, it's the connection between our brain, our bodies, and our beliefs about beauty, thanks to the patriarchy, right? Like in all the messaging and the social conditioning and all of that stuff layered on top. And so when we ignore, neglect, or reject those relationships, that's what activates that stress response. And that stress response is informing and influencing how we think and about ourselves, like what shows up on our skin, how we feel in our skin, how we show up in the world. So it's so important that everything that you're saying, Carol, is it's just, it's so spot on. It's about reconnecting to ourselves and really valuing the relationship that we have to our bodies and to ourselves. Because when we can cultivate and nurture that, like we do with our partners or our kids and treat them with such loving kindness, but we shit all over ourselves. Mm -hmm. Like it's, that's where that self-compassion and that nurturing. We're at, We're at the end of the list. You know, yeah. that, that's part of the breast cancer miasm that as a homeopath, women take care of everyone else and not ourselves. Mm -hmm. so, but we're, we can just see how capable we are, right? We do it for everyone else. We just have to give ourselves permission to, to turn it on ourselves. And the messaging in our society is if we do take care of ourselves, then we're then we're labeled as being selfish, which mm -hmm. drives me crazy. I tell all the women in my community, I want you to be labeled as selfish. And if somebody says that to you, you go, yes, thank you so much. I worked hard to be selfish. I'm putting yeah. myself first. I have a, I got a diagnosis. It's like I got to pay attention and I got to like get rid of all the extraneous stuff that isn't moving me forward in a path of, path of health. Yeah, I so agree because who, how else are you supposed to be? Who else is gonna take care of yourself? You, and taking care of yourself, they say selfish, but it's sacred. If you, if you have no energy, if you're fatigued, if you are dealing with illness and have no energy, how are you gonna take care of everybody else? right? It's like, you have to take care. You have to take that time. It's so vital. And the messaging, unfortunately, in our society, and as we get older, 
I mean, thankfully, menopause is having its day right now. It's about time, but that we still have a long way to go to, to strip away the layers of the shame and the guilt and all the things that have been piled on for so long about women as we mature, that we don't look a certain way, act a certain way, fit a certain mold. I mean, if that's, I mean, there's just so much there that we just need to like free ourselves of. There's so much that you just brought up. Um, I want to talk a little bit about, I know this may be, seem like it's off topic, but it's going, it's staying on topic. I'm watching this show called Hacks and there was this, um, and it's with an older actress who's just hasn't had a lot of plastic surgery and she's has wrinkles and but she, she obviously takes care of herself she's really amazing and she's labeled as the b-i-t-c-h of the com she's a stand-up comedian in the, the series and she gets on this stage in sacramento and this young hip supposed guy introduces her and is very hostile and demeaning and she gets up there and she just lands into him and she says when are you ever going to stop and um she she creates a situation in su in such a way where she's called him out and she also lets everyone know that she's still on top and this this in the series the woman was the first um, late night host show i mean she paved in the series the way for women and she has this attitude of being, you know, difficult. And I think we should all be labeled, quote, difficult, because that means we're standing up for ourselves in every area. That's about what empowerment is about. It's about saying, no, that doesn't really work. And when I um, <clears throat> accompanied my dear friend to chemotherapy and all of her 18 months of breast cancer care, which is how I got into this. Um, there was a time she was being treated at UCSF for infusions and we came prepared with remedies and teas and the healing smoothie and you, you know it. And she did better than anybody else, but one of the nurses didn't pay attention. And she, my friend had good veins and she blew out a vein. And I looked at her and I said, you weren't paying attention, you blew out. She goes, sorry about that. I, I was ready to like I was very upset. I was very calm. And I said, you don't talk to a person in that attitude that you've just hurt. Mm -hmm. You don't say sorry about that. That's dismissive. You need to understand that you weren't paying attention. This person has good veins. Even if she didn't have good veins, you blew out a vein. That's a big deal. Mm -hmm. So I had to go talk to the charge nurse to get them to understand. And then we put some herbs on it and it was fine. But it's like, you have to stand up for yourself when you're in the medical world and you don't want to worry about if you're labeled you need to be respectful of course but don't just sit back quietly and that's why there's so much education that women need to understand i just had an appointment with uh, a woman this morning who has uh, dcis which is an early stage of breast cancer and the standard of care is if you have that, the next test is called an oncotype, breast cancer recurrence index, and she didn't have one. And I went, what? And she, it's not her job to know that because she wasn't working with me at the beginning, but now she's on the phone talking to her oncologist. Why didn't I have this test? I need this test ordered right away. It's never too late to become empowered. So let's talk about the messaging that, quote, bad skin gives the women. Because I think that's really important. My daughter has she's 27 and her skin isn't so great. She's put Accutane on it, all this other stuff, but she's not quite able. And she has me as a mom, but of course she doesn't listen to Dr. Mom. <laughs> I yes. say, honey, hormones, you're estrogen dominant. We need to do a Dutch hormonal test. She goes, mom, please, I'm a medical student. I'm not doing any of that. So um, we're not learning about that in medical school. Mom, we're doing this. It's unfortunate. Mm -hmm. So uh, she'll get there eventually. It's not, you know, she's an adult. She has to make her own decisions. Hopefully she doesn't see this. She'll kill me. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, mom, what are you doing? Uh, Dim helped my daughter with her skin. Yes, Liz, that's great. I can't get my daughter to take it. Oh, leave me. I sent it to her. That and it, probiotics and everything else. She has a whole pharmacy in her kitchen of her apartment. So yeah. <laughs> let's talk about... Um, and thank you for commenting, Liz. Good job. Um, what are the messages that bad skin gives is giving? Well, I think 
I would like to reframe that it's not necessarily bad messages, just an offering, an invitation, really like when things show up on your skin, acne, eczema, alopecia, so hair loss, um, yeah. worsening of psoriasis. It's really an invitation that your body is asking something of you that it's not getting. And so um, it's really just an opportunity to look at, all right, what's happening in my life? How am I living? How am I sleeping? <laughs> am I am I speaking my truth? So many of um, the women, when it when we're going through a session, they they get this lump in their throat. Yeah, right. right? And so it's that that I'm not. If you're into energy and chakras and all of that, it, it, yeah, it's absolutely. powerful. So it's it's so fascinating, and we move that through. And sometimes it comes out in tears, and they feel so much better and relaxed. But it's like it's there's stored emotion and energy in your body, mm -hmm. and it's our opportunity when things are showing up on our skin. It's an indication. Your skin is both a window to and a reflection of what's happening beneath it. So we have to go beneath the surface. We need to go beneath the surface, and we may not not always know exactly in the moment what is at the root cause. But layer by layer, you can get there. Right. Start with the thing that you can start with. Right. Like what what for acne, for instance. So we know that diet can play a role. Sugar um, is, is inflammatory. Uh, we know that it can um, also trigger um, and, and dairy can trigger the the oil glands um, and inflammatory cascade. We know, especially if your fine lines, wrinkles, um, sugar creates uh, glycation end products, which bind to your collagen and your elastin, making them much more friable and they essentially break. So that results oh, in- yeah. I don't want my collagen breaking. Thank you very much. I need all my collagen being like smooth as possible. Right. And so that more fine lines, skin tech, and that's also where stress plays a role. Stress is probably, <laughs> into, I, I do not like this term anti-aging, but it's in all the marketing, all the yeah. lotions, the potions and the serum. Learning to manage your stress is the most potent anti-aging treatment regimen that you can put in your daily routine. Because when our primary stress hormone cortisol is elevated, what happens is it breaks down your collagen and your elastin, and it prevents uh, formation of new collagen. So if when you're stressed, especially you notice your wounds are not healing as well, more fine lines and wrinkling, um, and it's cumulative. And the other issue is all our hormones are derived from the same building block. So your body is prioritizing survival, the stress response, right? We're trying to adapt to whatever threat we, we, we think is um, coming at us. So as your body is making more cortisol to deal with it, other hormones downstream are taking a back seat, like your thyroid hormone. And we know that thyroid plays a big role in skin health. Lateral third of the eyebrows thinning is a sign of not always, but it is often a telltale sign of low functioning thyroid. Thyroid also plays a role in, in the texture of the skin. So low thyroid will result in dry skin, irritated skin. And sometimes there's deposition. It causes what we call mucopolysaccharides, a sugar uh, that our body produces to deposit in the skin, making the skin kind of lumpy, right? So your skin can tell you so many things. And this happens with when we don't manage our stress. So, so your thyroid takes, takes a hit. Your sex hormones also take a hit. And yeah. then we're in the postmenopausal phase of life. We, we're already depleted, but estrogen plays a big role in hair health and your, and your skin health as well. So when our estrogen is um, declining and then further declining, whatever reserves we have are able to make because of our stress response, You'll notice that your hair may be shedding more. Hair is finer, thinner. That happens with women as a side effect of aromatase inhibitors and tamoxifen. It's a very big side yeah. effect. And all of the women in my community, I'd say 99% after they finish active treatment for breast cancer are put on tamoxifen aromatase inhibitors. And 
those drugs are a very mixed bag and they're they're being prescribed at a dosing of for like a, the horse in the china shop syndrome it's just such a strong dose to block the estrogen yeah um, and many of the women you know what i'm trying to do is to get the women out of that middle of the bell curve with if you're eating the standard american diet you're you're creating inflammation all the all the way and the standard american diet has been proven to increase cancer rates four times. So the first thing women need to do who are here listening is get divorce the standard American diet. That's, you know, I don't use that word divorce lightly. It's a serious word. And we need to get back to more farm to table, healthy eating the way we used to before we had, you know, food in a box, so to speak, or worse, food in a microwave, right? Yeah, yeah, it's very true. Um, yeah, I think I, I'll just name, I know, I know I'm kind of harping on stress, but the, no, stati go right ahead. the statistics are upwards of 90% of all doctor's visits are for stress related ailments wow. and, and skin issues are the number one reason people go to the doctor. Oh, Which really? Is, yep. I didn't know that. It, it out it, and then back pain is like right behind that. And, but skin issues are among the, the, the number one reason people go to the doctor. So I, I say this because our skin is, right? Like, this is what people see. This is how we show up. This is how, like, we live in the skin. How do we feel walking out into the world? This is why learning how to navigate stress, which is challenging, it may have gotten us into the position of developing cancer. It's not the only factor. I'm not saying that. No, of course is not. No, there's not. I always say there's not one thing that makes any illness, especially cancer. There's not right. one thing. It's kind of what we call the exposome, right? Everything that we come in contact in our world, our air, our food, our relationships, toxins in our products, all of it, but also that internal environment too. So it's just an opportunity when things are showing up on your skin, or if you don't feel good in your skin, it's just an invitation to kind of break things down and do a bit of an audit and give yourself permission to, to take that time to really care for yourself. Like if your kid was sick, you do everything you possibly could to make sure they felt held and safe and secure. And I think our conversation here today is really just highlighting that we need to do that for ourselves as well. You need to take the time. It's very beautiful. Uh, take yeah. the time. You need to carve out the time. And, and it, um, yeah. And I was just going to say, I'm sorry for coming up, but I know it can feel like you don't have time. That's part of the breast cancer miasm. Rush, rush, rush. Do, do, do. I have to do this. I have to do that. Yeah. But it's all, but really, that's just a lie, right? It's all, that's, that's our mindset. mindset. That's just our mindset, right? Mm -hmm. That's just our brain offering us, you know, what the default pattern, the three things, right? Avoiding pain, seeking pleasure, and doing things as efi efficiently and effectively as possible. Well, the default, the efficiency is just be like, I'm busy, 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 busy. And part of why we are so busy is because we don't want to feel some of the shitty, the uncomfortable feelings. The grief, the anger, the frustration, the shame, that's what's underneath that busyness. Absolutely. That's what's driving the bu busyness. And in one of my free classes, I have this photo of this beautiful elephant in this beautiful room. And an elephant is a sacred animal. And it's like what we think we're not, you know, we put on the back burner. Oh, I'm not going to deal with this now. Or we unconsciously put on the back burner becomes like an elephant taking up all the space in the room. And that's a metaphor of what happens in your psyche. You have all this unresolved stuff inside of you and that keeps your river from flowing smoothly. And then you get stagnation and that creates, you know, blood stagnation in Chinese medicine is the beginning of a tumor or it's the beginning of inflammation. So it's very important to open the door to that room and look at the elephant. And we all have that. It's impossible being an older woman, even if you're in your 30s, you're still older, you're not 20 anymore, without having some version of uh, one size or another of an elephant in the room or underneath the rug. It's a good metaphor. And mm -hmm. that stuff is 
creating unhealthiness in your body, inflammation, it can show up on your skin. I love this, what you have behind yours. Let's go skinny dipping. It's very beautiful. Yeah. So um, that is my soon to be podcast. I've been sitting oh, on a bit of called the skinny dipping prescription, but I, I put that sign up there as a reminder. Um, again, I'll be full transparency. Why do I do this work? Because I need it. We teach best ways to learn the most. I am not like, I am not saying I'm fully over this or through this. I am on this journey alongside everybody. It's a process. It's a, such a beautiful way of putting it. Women think, well, how long is this going to take? Do I have to be on these pills forever? Am yeah. I going to get off? And I go, first of all, we don't do the forever syndrome. We don't, we can't fast forward that much. Let's just take it in month, a couple months chunks. And, yeah. you know, the couple months turn into a couple of years and there's no one protocol. You start on one level and then you do that for a while and then your blood work changes and you change and we need to adjust. But it's not like you open the door to the room and you go, oh, there's an elephant. Well, there's five things on the elephant. I'll just talk about them all at once and then I'll be done. There won't be any elephant anymore. Healing is a process, right? And it's not that easy to stay on the path because society and life tend to want to pull you off, right? Totally, totally. And for me, I realized I even though I was in dermatology, I, I, it wasn't until recently, actually, I, I really realized the real reason why um, I went into dermatology. Um, and I had, really, I, I had been hiding in plain sight. Here I am, all the accomplishments, dual board certified physician, lots of other certifications, career, the kids, the house, the blah, 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 blah you know. And I was like, I'm fucking miserable. <laughs> like, I, but it was, you know, my health fell apart. And I was like, oh my gosh. I'm just hiding. I'm hiding behind all the accolades and inside it's a, it's, it's, it's like a, it's a tsunami in there. Yeah. And so once I was willing to get naked, right. And I, as a dermatologist, I had to get people naked on a physical level to look at their skin, to teach them what to look for, to save their own life. Skin cancer is the most prevalent cancer in the United States and in other countries around the world. You have to know what to look for. But what I found when my own health fell apart is I also have to have that willingness to get naked mentally and emotionally and really be with what's here. And we do it one layer at a time, mm -hmm. strip it away. So that's what the skinny dipping me method, you know, the, what skinny dipping is all about. And just being, being willing mm -hmm. to look at the surface and then go beneath it and strip away the, the layers that just aren't serving anymore so that we can reveal those that actually are nourishing, that do allow us to show up as the fullest expression of ourselves. And it's not something that's easy to do on your own. Oh no, right? it's so, really almost impossible. It's sort of like, why, I noticed this with the breast, with breast cancer, it's like women have this concept, well, I'll just go to Dr. Google and I'll research and I'll, oh, this person says to take this vitamin and that person says to take that. And then they come and they have this conglomeration of God only knows what, most of which is not made to pharmaceutical quality standards. And they're reluctant to get expert guidance or ask for help. And that's part of the breast cancer miasm. And that is also part of the messaging we've received from society, which is you don't ask for help until you can't function anymore, like the woman who it's she couldn't keep her house clean, quote unquote. And she goes to the doctor, which is usually a man, unfortunately, and the patriarchy then gives her an antidepressant. Um, that's not a message that I support at, in my perspective of what's healing. And we need, everybody needs help. Like, you know, you can't, if your car is stuck in snow, you don't think you should be able to push it out of the snow drift by yourself, right? You call AAA and they, and a guy comes, you know, there's appropriate times where we need a uh, positive man with the tow truck. I don't think I've ever had a woman in a tow truck, but there's no, there's no reason she couldn't be and pulls you out. I mean, that's what it takes some time, but I want to talk about the phrase menopause because um, I just was talking about the word manifest with someone and the word manifest and menopause manifest has the word man in it. So it's about a masculine perspective, but manifesting doesn't have to be masculine. It could be feminist. It could be feminine esting. 
And menopause is a word that was made up by men. Men, oh, pause. So I think we need a more feminine perspective on menopause. That is fat. You know what? I love this. I love language. I had not even thought about that. And I am grateful. Like right now, there was um, there's, I mean, during uh, COVID, I dove into menopause medicine, and um, you know, because there is such a connection between sex hormones and skin health, estrogen, and um, with hyaluronic acid and and hair and all that, fascinating, and vaginal skin being skin, right? Um, but there are so many companies that have come up in the last couple of years, all focusing on this phase of life. And in fact, there was an announcement. One of the companies, I'm blanking on which one it was, just wound up in Ulta. Like this was like mind blowing, uh, record breaking the first time ever. And I thought, oh my gosh, like why, why, why is it taking so long? And thankfully there are more people who are vocalizing a lot of what you're saying. Like it's time, we need to change the conversation, take back what we, with ours essentially, because of what we're the ones experiencing it. Not about men. No, but it's so fascinating in terms of like, it needs a rebrand, a, a, re, a new name, like femopause or something. I don't, that doesn't have a good ring to it, but I don't. <laughs> well, I have a book here. I'm going to, I'm going to leave for two seconds and get my book. Well, hey, everybody. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Here I am. Here I am. This is somebody did do that. The upgrade. Woo! Oh, and buy a dog. I love it. I'll have to check yeah. that out. So everybody can check this out. I love it. It is a Bay Area medical doctor, and she feels this way. That why is it called men? Oh, pause. It shouldn't be. Yeah. And why is it a pause? It's a pause. It's a sense it's transition. It's, it's you know, it's it's a, a, a process. We need a new name. Feminine, tra fem, fem. Tra it's it shouldn't. It needs renaming. Right. I mean, yeah. Pa I guess. Well, all right. In terms of like pausing, acknowledging this moment, absorbing and receiving all that came before, and like just giving yourself a moment, maybe even to grieve a part of our lives that's over. Okay. Pause. But I also, but uh, unfortunately, a lot of the messaging is like, well, this is a pause. This is like period, actually. It's not just a pause. It's a period on your life. It's over. Your sex life is over, the, you know, your career and all the things. It's like, no. 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 I'm just um, getting started and I'm going to be old. I'm already, you know, I'm just getting started. And um, my, I have a lot of friends who are retiring and I'm going, mm, what's that? I, you know, I'm like really engaged in my work. Um, I think we need, to it's not a pause it's like a transition you're in a new phase of your life so it's fem phasing or something we need a new name yeah we have to take back this is not about men it's about the feminine and connecting to your feminine on a much deeper level yeah and connecting to your skin on the outside and on the inside on a much deeper level and being much more honest about who you are and what's working and shedding. It's like all that stuff that you don't need and not letting, you know, it's, I know this is really dumb, but the, somehow that older woman who was so great in hacks, it's a, it's a metaphor and it's not an accident that it's come out now. She won a global golden, Oscar, golden globe awards. She deserved it. It's like, why are women branded as, being not nice if we stick up for ourselves, you know, the B word, which I don't particularly want to say here to offend anybody, but um, everyone knows what I'm talking about. We're not being, if we're being um, empowered and sticking up for ourselves, we're being assertive and affirmative about who we are and what we want for our life. So to, if somebody calls you a B, you know, you could turn on and say, thank you. I'm doing my job sticking up for myself. Right. Right. And if, right. If being a B means um, I'm being assertive, then yeah, I'll take it. You can call me that all day long. Yeah, And I say that, and I know that it's not easy and it, and it feels uncomfortable. But I think at this stage of our lives, to your point, shedding all of this, it's very liberating. And especially in terms of, we think of, you know, 
this transition where hormones are down and libido and, and there, there may be vaginal dryness because there's decrease in hormones and all of that. Well, there's definitely vaginal dryness for women yes. who are on estrogen hormonal therapy. Yes. Uh, exactly. It's a big concern. It is. And I think it's also important too, that just because you're, you've had breast cancer or you're dealing, you know, that, being hormonal therapy, replay, hormone replacement therapy, isn't necessarily off the table. You do not have to suffer unnecessarily. It's a very individual decision and medically it's a very individual case. But I think it's really important that women understand they have options. That if their doctor says, nope, you've had breast cancer, not a candidate, always advocate for yourself. Is that true for me? Well, that's, you know, we're getting to a very, this is a right. really specific topic. And exactly, exactly. But my whole point about, but my whole point about this time in life of sensuality or sexuality, it, that also plays into this as well of advocating for yourself, what you need, what you want and being assertive in all areas of your life, not just in your professional life, but in your personal life, um, around the house, um, and also for your medical care. To your point about your um, client this morning, in terms of advocating for certain tests that might need to be run, mm -hmm. right? So if you hear something that doesn't sit right with you or you're curious about it, don't necessarily just take things at face value. It's okay to ask questions. And if oh, someone shuts you down, then, then then you just move on to somebody else to ask questions. <laughs> so if you're thinking about doing hormone replacement therapy and you've had breast cancer, in my opinion, you need to meet with a medical gynecol medical oncological gynecologist. Yes. And your specific blood work and your BMI, and that means your weight and everything needs to be very uh, individually taken care of because there's a lot of conflicting research about hormones, and breast cancer and there are there's i think it's a black and white there are camps which go yeah it's fine or there are camps that go like absolutely not i'm in sort of like the absolutely not department to be quite frank and if you i mean but rarely it really depends i mean there's a lot that needs to be done before i would consider a postmenopausal woman giving her hormones. And the main thing is if you've been postmenopausal for two years, you need to get a carotid artery scan before anything else happens. Because what can happen is you could get plaque buildup as a decrease in estrogen. And then when you take hormones two years or more postmenopause, the hormones make that plaque, you know, diminish and it can cause a stroke. So there is a very, very specific way you need to be evaluated before you consider going on hormones, postmenopause, whether you've had breast cancer or not. And if you've had breast cancer, that needs to be evaluated by a medical oncological gynecologist and an integrated practitioner, in my opinion. Um, I, I totally agree. And so one of the best resources, um, and I'm sure you're probably familiar with the book Estrogen Matters by Dr. Avram Blooming, Mm -hmm. um, he is a medical oncologist and does a really nice job of sharing the medical literature um, that talks about women who've had breast cancer and the risk factors and, and, and such. And so for women, you know, it's two years is a little sooner than 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 I'm. That's what the research says. But, you know, not with breast cancer, it's just general research. Yeah. So the research that I had come across is it's usually above the age of 60, um, women's risk of cardiovascular uh, disease is on par with men. And if it's been 10 years from the time you went through menopause to starting hormones, that is also a window that needs to be um, oh, yeah. rigorously managed for this. So um, I think we're on the same page of it's a very individual decision and choice and it has to be done in conjunction with your your personal medical history with a, a physician um, and practitioners who are very knowledgeable in this area and that feel aligned again this is all about tuning into the messages your body is sending you if you have fear that this is not going to work for you or or what like 
you have to listen to that also. Oh yeah, that's trumps. That that if you have that fear or concern as far as the, that uh, I don't want to use that other word that uh, goes to the top of the list that Absolutely. negates. Well, yeah, maybe I'll do it. No, if you have concern, like the answer is no. We have to pay attention to the clues, in my opinion. Absolutely, but I do think that if if um, people have not come across estrogen matters as a, a resource, as what not the Ultimate put it in the chat and women can look yeah. up. It's easily Amazon. ordered on Amazon, ladies. Yeah. Yeah. It, it just gives, um, in terms of that camp, like the black and white, this is more on the here's here are the here are the studies that show that for certain individuals it can be a safe option. So I think it's just a matter of knowing that you have options. And that option could be no, it could be yes, it could be somewhere in the middle. That's fine. And there are always alternatives, but I think advocating for your own needs and then pursuing your options from that lens and working with someone who has a lot of experience and expertise is up on the current literature um, and testing that's required is really important. Yes, absolutely. hundred percent. And I also want to say that you need to be clear about why you want and why you're considering hormone replacement therapy after having had breast cancer. If it's because you're not happy with your sex life, um, there are many ways of having intimacy with your spouse that don't involve uh, needing to have a you know a dry a wet vagina, so to speak. So there, I mean, you know, or if your spouse only wants to do it that way, then maybe it's time for a deeper conversation about how can we be intimate in a way that doesn't necessitate me going on birth back on hormones, even if they're bioidentical, because bioidentical hormones are still, you're putting in exogenous hormones, they still need to be broken down. And you need to find out what was the problem with the original hormones that weren't being broken down. So that's where the testing with the Dutch hormonal panel comes in, state of the art is one of the ways that we've figure out what's going on with your breakdown of your hormones. Where is the miscommunication that we can then address? Is it your gut? You know, so that's where it's where, where it often is. So we could go on and on, but I have a patient that I need to get started with. And I don't want to take up more of your donating wonderful time to be with us here. We, we are so compatible and, and so think along the lines so much on so many of our ways of viewing health and dis-ease and healing and the path of healing. It's just wonderful for you to spend time with me and my community. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. And one other thing, how can women reach you? Yeah. So my website needs, it needs a redo, but it's probably the best place. Uh, drkirabar.com or on Instagram, drkirabar is where you can find me. And just to your point about sex, uh, again, managing stress, like there's a whole lit about mindfulness and tuning back into your body, that whole list, that invisible workload that will shut down your libido in a heartbeat. Oh. So we have to deal with that first. And honestly, you might be surprised how turned on you get. <laughs> yeah. Well, okay, since we're talking about this, you can't, you know, when you're 20, you can just do a quickie, but when you're older, you can't do rush, 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 do, 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 800 multitasks and then go, okay, I'm ready to be intimate now. It doesn't, doesn't work like that anymore, ladies, right? No, no. And so actually I have several clients that that's one of the biggest issues that we're working through is intimacy. And it's a matter of getting back slowing into down. that and slowing through. And it's, it's amazing to see the trajectory. So it's exciting. That. Your yeah. face just lights up. So that's where we went. That's what hey, we went. Pleasure. Come on. Get pleasure, pleasure in ourselves or others. Like that's that's top priority. Way to go. 100 <laughs> percent Thank you so much. Lovely to hang out with you, ladies. It's Carol Laurie and Dr. Barr, and there'll be more later. Have a lovely afternoon and thank you all for your comments and for joining. Take care, everyone. Bye for now. Bye.